This shouldn't be possible. As a bat takes flight, its body kicks into hyperdrive. As they beat their wings up to 15 times per second, their heart rate races to over a thousand beats a minute, rapidly raising their core body temperature to around 41 degrees Celsius. Putting any other mammal under this strain creates such high metabolic damage that it starts to rip apart its own DNA, as its cells produce toxic byproducts of metabolism. For most mammals, this causes extreme inflammation, cell damage, and then possibly even death. But the bat lives through this feverish flight night after night and comes off healthier as a result, living 10 times longer than our understanding of biology would otherwise predict. The underlying reason for why bats are just such elite survivalists comes inherent to their biology, and if the lessons could be learned and adapted into our own biology, they could extend human lifetimes not by years, but by decades. Beyond the bat's athletic performance, they may just be the healthiest mammal on Earth. And that's kind of a strange statement, because typically bats are associated with some of the most horrific diseases. In 1994, horses at the racing stable in Brisbane, Australia, fell sick with a mysterious illness. Thirteen horses ultimately died, but not before the illness had learned to jump into human beings, leading to the death of one of their trainers. The culprit was the Hendra virus, a pathogen carried by fruit bats that can infect horses and now can subsequently infect humans. Outbreaks of Ebola, Nipah, Marburg virus, and SARS-CoV-2 have all been linked to originating in bats. We did a video on this previously on one particular cave that seemed to breed many of these diseases. You can check it out wherever I've left a link or in the description. Strangely though, bats don't seem to suffer the effects of these diseases. Even rabies, a disease which left untreated in any other mammal, including humans, is fatal, is rarely fatal in bats. And stranger, bats appear to live unnaturally long lifetimes, giving strange credibility to every vampire movie you've ever seen. Vampires do exist. Generally, there is a trend where larger mammals tend to have longer lifespans than smaller mammals. For instance, larger mammals like elephants, whales, and humans often live for several decades, while smaller mammals like rats and mice typically have much shorter lifespans of maybe only a few years. There's no definitive theory that explains this, but one that attempts to is called the rate of living theory, which suggests that larger animals have slower metabolisms and hence accumulate damaging factors like free radicals at a slower rate than smaller mammals with faster metabolism. This slower accumulation of damage could contribute to longer lifespans in larger mammals. But another theory suggests that evolutionary pressures might play a bigger factor. Larger animals often have fewer natural predators and may be able, to, as a result, to invest energy in fewer offspring over a longer period of time, whereas smaller mammals may have many predators, often needing to reproduce quickly and in large numbers, which may have negatively selected for longer lifespan genes as they aren't needed necessarily for the species survival. Regardless of the cause, determined to buck that trend is the bat. Mice live for about one to two years, rats in the wild for two to three. Some species of bats have been observed to live for 41 years in the wild, and that is 10 to 20 times longer than other similarly sized animals. One species, Bechstein's bat, doesn't appear to age across a certain measurement of aging. Something called senescent cells, which are cells that have been damaged and might become cancerous so your body essentially issues a stop command to them to prevent them from replicating and then developing into a tumour. In theory, that's good news, but these zombie cells secrete a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokinins, chemokinins and proteases. Although the damaged cell has been prevented from reproducing, the factors that it secretes can cause inflammation and damage to surrounding tissues, contributing to various pathologies including things like osteoarthritis and neurodegenerative diseases. As you age, you have more and more of these zombie cells accumulating in your body, which is why we associate those diseases as age-related. When studied though, Bechstein's bats exhibit negligible senescence. And as a result, the onset of many diseases of aging that we see in most species just never happened to them. 
Although robust to many threats, sadly it does turn out that humans are pretty effective at killing bats. Bextein's bats in particular, their population has plummeted recently, specifically in the UK, due to loss of woodland. If the loss of wildlife and endangered species is something you'd like to help, I've got a message at the end of the video from our friends at Planet Wild that will help explain how you can be involved in preventing these sorts of habitat loss. But first, I want to talk about the fact that there is clearly some sort of biological wizardry going on in the bat. What is it and what can we learn from it to improve human health? In a 2017 study across several institutions, including the Max Planck Institute for Ornithology, which is based in Germany, researchers studied bat flight behavior, which has previously been examined under controlled wind tunnel experiment. But this time they fitted bats with teeny tiny heart rate monitors to measure flight in their natural environment. They found that during rest, the bat's heart rates clocked in at around 370 beats per minute. For reference, the average mouse heart rate is five to 600 beats per minute. During flight, however, the tiny bat hearts jump to an excess of 900 beats per minute. During these flights, similar studies have recorded core body temperatures rising in the bats to over 40 degrees Celsius, which is in American units about an average daytime peak of Vegas in July, say. In humans and in most mammals, this would count as a medical emergency and a severe fever, but in bats, it might actually be one of the keys of their survivability and resistance to disease. Our bodies produce fever responses as part of its defense mechanism against infections. Many pathogens that invade us are sensitive to temperature. So if we can induce a fever and raise our core body temperature, we can inhibit the growth and replication of these pathogens. The idea that bats are better able to survive and regulate the diseases that inhabit their bodies is known as flight as fever theory, that each night during their time flying, they are essentially cooking the viruses and preventing them from ever fully taking hold of them. That's intuitive as an idea, but there's some debate around the full effect of this theory. In several dosing studies, an article from The Atlantic reported that bats have been found to be able to survive with 10 million units of Ebola virus per milliliter of blood, or 10 million units of MERS coronavirus per gram of lung, and that the researchers that were studying these bats were unable to discern any serious problem with the bat's health. So it wasn't that the bats weren't becoming infected and that infection was prevented by these fever events, but instead that the disease just seemed to be able to take hold and still have no effect. Another thorn in the side of fever theory is that there's a range of desert mammals and obviously birds that frequently also have high body temperatures, but unlike bats, aren't able to survive with the high viral loads that we saw in these studies. Lin Fa Wang, a biochemist and zoonotic disease expert at Duke Medical School in Singapore, suggests that this may be why bats are such effective spreaders of disease. Pathogens that otherwise are deadlies to us can live for a very long time in bats with basically no ill effect, increasing the likelihood of transmission to other animals that the bat comes in contact with. The inflammatory response associated with fever and raised body temperature is good in theory and is designed to kill infections, but it can also have some very negative effects for the host. It can in particular degrade proteins and enzymes, it can damage organs, and potentially it can produce organism-wide symptoms like hallucinations or even seizures. In some of the worst diseases, it's actually our own body's response to the pathogen that causes more damage than the pathogen itself. Itself. We saw this in cases like influenza and COVID-19 and other respiratory viruses that can lead to something called a cytokine storm. Cytokines are a small protein that play a crucial role in cell signaling, especially in the immune system. They're released by various types of cell in response to detection of infection, inflammation, and other immune challenges. In a normal immune response, cytokines help to regulate the body's reaction to disease or injury. However, in the event that there is overproduction of these molecules, it can lead to a hyperactive immune response that causes significant harm to the body, potentially leading to severe complications and even death. In 2018, a study by Wang found that some antiviral components called interferons, which alert nearby cells to infection and cause them to put more energy into antiviral activity and defenses, are actually continually expressed in bats, whereas in humans, they are only expressed when a pathogen is detected. 
This means that in humans, our reaction needs to be much more extreme as we're essentially playing catch up and our immune system, as a result, can be over eager to respond, which as any hay fever sufferer knows, can hurt us when otherwise these reactions should be helping us. In a 2020 paper, Wang found evidence that IRF3, which is a central regulator of innate antiviral responses in mammals, included in bats a molecular group called a serine residue that improves its performance in fighting viruses. Replacing the serine residue in bat IRF3 with the leucine residue that human cells produce decreased the antiviral protection in bat cells and vice versa, the addition of serine residue into human IRF3 significantly enhanced its antiviral protection in human cells. So bats have two interesting mechanisms at play, an always on immune system essentially, and one that is better placed at targeting viral loads. What this means though for a virus trying to infect cells of a bat is that it has a much harder job doing so. The negative consequence is that these viruses evolve ways to infiltrate and bypass these defenses, which is probably why if these viruses then do transmit to humans, they do a lot more damage to us. To bring this conversation full circle, the question is why have bats evolved these capabilities and other mammals just haven't? If this isn't the flight fever that prevents this infection, maybe it's the flight and the fever it induces that has forced bat biology to become really good at dealing with the negative effects of damage on their body. A 2018 study and another one in 2019 by Wang found that although some interferon systems are always primed and ready to go, others are damped and very slow to activate. This may have arisen because the metabolic demands of flight cause DNA damage and the release of self-DNA into the cytoplasm of the cell, and having a system that is slow to trigger on the presence of self or foreign DNA means that bats produce lower rates of inflammation and so less damage to cells. Though the direct cause and effect relationship of which came first is still absolutely being debated, this effect combined with an increased presence of DNA damage checkpoint genes that give the bat cells a better than normal ability to detect genetic damage that might lead to things like cancer and damage associated with aging, allows bats to clean up and dispose of those damaged cells. As far as we understand, this is likely what gives bats their order of magnitude longer lives than most mammals of their size and metabolic rate. But how do we apply these learnings into human health? Modern medicine is starting to look at novel ways to replicate some of the benefits and reduce some of the negatives of our own infection defense systems. And actually it has been for quite a while, back during a slightly less ethical time period in the history of medicine, Julius Wagner Jureg, an Austrian physician and neurologist, injected asylum patients suffering from late stage neurosyphilis, an infection that involves the central nervous system caused by the T. pallidum bacteria, with a vial of what he hoped would be a new wonder drug. No, it wasn't penicillin, steroids or anything that we use now, it was malaria. Coughs malaria into our face? For the lucky patients, the malaria-induced fever raised the patient's core body temperature and essentially cooked the bacterial infection. The malaria was then dealt with with a quinine injection. For the unluckier patients, either the neurosyphilis remained or the malaria-induced fever cooked both the bacteria and the patient and neither survived. Although the outcomes involved significant risks, for the first time it was shown that disease could actually be cured, and this work actually earned him the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1927. Nearly a hundred years have passed since then, and most of us would prefer medicine that is a little bit less exciting. Perhaps there is a way to encourage our own immune system into a strong but targeted response to finish off any serious illness, or maybe we could even live a life free of cold symptoms through milder immune responses to gentler threats. There's a lot of things that out there that I could talk about at the moment, from therapies that can bind to and highlight cells that look cancerous to make the immune system better able to find and destroy them, to videos that I've already done on a company working to reverse the process in cells that lead to senescence. You can find that video again wherever I've left it. I think the most directly related one that I can talk about though is one that directly aims to target the immune system and suppress some of its more destructive effects. Though caveat here, I'm an investor in this company so I wanna get that on the table for the activity of full transparency. This company is working in a field called gene silencing. Gene silencing therapies are a medical treatment that function by turning off or reducing the expression of specific genes, usually ones that are responsible for producing a disease. 
Argonaut RNA, however, are applying this technique to quieting the pathways that express inflammation as part of the immune response, because sometimes it's detrimental to a patient if their immune response is being overzealous. Having a reversible silencing system for a patient experiencing sepsis or maybe a liver disease where the silencing wears off after a few days or few hours so that the long-term immune system isn't weakened could allow at-risk patients to survive an acute illness where otherwise their own body would exacerbate their underlying disease or do damage to their organs. These are obviously only used in acute examples, like I said, where there is a medical emergency actually happening. We aren't yet seeing similar ideas Ideas to give us more bat-like biology of a calibrated immune and inflammation response permanently just yet, but there will obviously be more to learn from our bat friends. So, importantly, don't bomb the bats, as some suggested earlier during the COVID outbreak. Bats are a cornerstone species, from eating pests and pollinating to providing fertilizer. Many bat species and their incredible biologies are already endangered, and we can't learn from them if they don't exist anymore. Often these come from habitat loss, which is one of the reasons that I want to take a moment to introduce and recommend Planet Wild, a social enterprise and a certified B Corp that funds ecosystem restoration. Each month they go on a new mission to preserve nature and wild life and then they document it on their YouTube channel. This way you can see for yourself how your contribution and the projects are making a difference. And as a supporter, you get to see the impact through monthly reports in the app and by following along on YouTube. On their latest mission, they're protecting sea turtles that are under threat from poachers by sending in an unexpected ally, a dog patrol. A very unusual solution, yet a really interesting watch. You can find a link to their website and mission videos in the description or by scanning this QR code. If you sign up with the code Dr. Ben, I will cover the first month of your subscription so you can see with your own eyes the great work they're carrying out and how easy it is as an individual to have an impact. Planet Wild has a great mission and team behind it, so do support them if you can. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. I've dropped a list of last week's winners for the dino shapes here. Drop me a message on Instagram at Dr. Ben Miles and I will ship you your prizes.